most disastrous year in a very long time has finally come to an end and people around the world are celebrating the end of 2020. The year had a lot of high expectations with regards to movies that were to be released with films such as Black Widow, No Time to Die, June, among others all slated to come out in 2020 and have all been pushed back to 2021 and beyond. However, some brave souls still released in 2020, whether it be through paid rental VODs, on streaming services, or in theaters when virus restrictions were eased. Some quality films still released last year, and in today's video, I'm going to be ranking my top 10 movies of 2020, right after this. So now then, ladies and gents, and welcome back to the channel. I hope you're all having a smashing day, just like myself. As always, I am your host, Brim Williams, and in today's video, I'm going to be ranking my top 10 movies in 2020. Like I said in the intro or the prelude, a lot of films still did come out this year, whether they be or through theaters when virus restrictions were eased, with films such as Tenet, Unhinged, Onward, and the like, or whether they came out on Netflix, like Trial of Chicago 7, Five Bloods, among others, or whether they came out through paid rental VODs, like Wonder Woman 1984, or Bloodshot, or The Invisible Woman. So we've got a lot to choose from. Obviously they're not the highest, highest calibre movies that we were kind of expecting to come out this year. I, I had to kind of be a little bit more realistic with this list than I would have done maybe in 2019, or if there was no virus maybe there may have been a miles better list than i'm going to give you today but still i enjoyed quite a lot of these films um they're really fun uh really interesting a lot of them and some of them were actually top quality like oscar quality and films. stop it right there hello ladies hello and gents there. i come to you in the form of a disembodied voice from the beyond to let you know that i realized whilst i was editing this video that i spoil pretty much every film that's on this list so if you don't want to be spoiled for the following films, Uncut Gems, Jojo Rabbit, The Gentleman, 1917, Bad Boys for Life, Birds of Prey, The Call of the Wild, Onward, Bloodshot, Mulan, Extraction, The Five Bloods, The Old Guard, Tenet, Enola Holmes, The Trial of Chicago 7, Soul and Jingle Jangle, then check out now and come back to the video once you've watched those movies. Also, while we're at it, in the spirit of this really long video, I thought I'd play a game with you guys at home if you're willing to join in. Basically, the idea of the game is you need to take a shot of whiskey or whatever, go to your liquor cabinet, find someone that you want to take a shot of and take a shot every time I say the word epic. And probably by the end of this video, you'll be just as drunk as me. Whoa, whoa. See that guy right there? Looks like he's hit rock bottom. Well, that guy's actually me. Now, I bet you're wondering how I got in this wacky situation. It all started in the summer of 86. No, no, don't touch me there. This is my no, no square. No, no, don't touch me there. No, no, my. <laughs> what are you doing here, Molly? Hey, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the video and I shall see you in a bit. So, just before I get into the top 10, as always on these videos, we always have honorable mentions. I've got a list of them right in front of me that I'm just going to read off. Films such as Uncut Gems with Adam Sandler that I actually thought was pretty good on Netflix. Uh, cool of the World with Harrison Ford and his dog Buck. I really, really enjoyed that movie. It's got some really good heart in it. Uh, Bloodshot, obviously with Vin Diesel, like I said, came out on paid VOD and is now available on Blu-ray and the like. Very uh, A valiant superhero movie, so at least we've got some superhero movies. Uh, Mulan, the new live action version. Uh, Extraction with Chris Hemsworth, The Five Bloods, uh, Enola Holmes, which was produced and stars in the lead, Millie Bobby Brown. And then 
the Netflix Christmas movie with Forrest Whitaker, Jingle Jangle. So they're all my honourable mentions. They've probably all popped up on the screen. Uh, they're all films that, although weren't bad, they just didn't kind of reach my list, if that makes sense. So they're all great movies. Go and check them out. They're all good in their own right. But they just missed out on my top 10. So in at number 10, we have one of the two releases that Pixar put out this year. In Onward, I really, really enjoyed this film. It has some great casting. You've got Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Octavia Spencer, and of course the main two, Chris Pratt and Tom Holland. They, Those two actors in particular, I know they're in the Avengers films and they're in a lot of Marvel films, but they don't always share the screen together. So to see these two very charismatic, entertaining, funny actors do a voice role like this playing two brothers was actually really interesting I, I like the story it's it's a very heartfelt um story about family and finding yourself and dealing with loss which is very pertinent to me this uh this last year as i lost my granddad which i've talked about before it was just a very interesting story it's very mythical there's some magic in it it's obviously set in modern times but in a world where witches warlocks elves and things like that were all real and then they kind of died out as the world became more modern and I just thought it was a really nice light felt story of these two brothers bonding in the wake of their father's death and trying to spend one last day with their dad it was really good really entertaining typical Pixar light-hearted uh, not childish but child friendly fun I just thought it was pretty good so in at number 10 is Onward so next up in number nine we have one of a flurry of Netflix movies on this list and the movie that was both produced and starred in by Charlize Theron I'm of course talking about The Old Guard there's two movies this year in particular that I thought well three movies I should say in particular that I thought had amazing stunts in them you had Birds of Prey which was done by the stunt team uh, that did John Wick you've got Old Guard and you've got Extraction Two of those are obviously Netflix movies and the extraction was done by Chris Hemsworth's uh, stunt double. It was his directorial debut, but this is something very different. It's based on a graphic novel done by Greg Rucker, I believe, who's written some wonderful books for Star Wars and comics for Star Wars in the past. And it's about these uh, soldiers, warriors that have fought in battles that managed to come back to life and end up becoming immortals. So um, there's guys in this mercenary group from Napoleon's era, from the Crusades, from even like all the way back in uh, mainland China when Genghis Khan invaded and stuff. And Charlie's Ferran in the lead role of uh, what they who they call Andy but it's Andromache of Scythia, so that's a mouthful. But it stars some really good people. Uh, I thought Charlize Theron was excellent in this film. She was, the stunt work that was in it was amazing. I thought she was probably the standout character, but we have people like Matthias Schoenarts, who's great in a lot of films. Marwen Kanzari, who's been in Aladdin, most recently and he's done a couple other films on Netflix that I need to get around to watching on my watch list I think he's a very good underrated actor that's going to be a big kind of star in the future um also stars um Chiwetel Ejiofor as he's been studying this mercenary group for a long time the the old guard group for a long time and um he kind of stays on the side of the other character that I really liked which is the bad guy that's played by Harry Mellon who played Dudley Dursley in Harry Potter he was the guy that always used to bully Harry Potter his like stepbrother if you want to call him that and he plays a very he, he had the kind of like Vex Luthor in Batman vs Superman air about him he wasn't um really intimidating but he had that bratty, almost um, faux sense of self. Like, 
there's you, he's, he can portray normal but there's just something slightly underlying underneath his character that sets him off and makes him this like aggressive over the top businessman and she went edgy for's char character keeps swaying from side to side with the old guard to uh, harry mellon's uh group that want to abduct the old guard to make sure that they can or an abduct the old guard to experiment on them so they can learn how to make immortal super soldiers essentially and she went edge of force character is kind of balancing between the two also another person i really liked in this film was kiki lane who plays niall who's the newest member of the the old guard essentially she's an afghan vet she's been fighting in afghanistan gets her neck slit open and she thinks she's about to die everybody thinks she's she dies uh, everybody thinks she's dead and she just comes back to life like everybody else in the old guard does and i just thought it was a really entertaining action-packed stunt filled film the stunts in this film honestly if there's nothing else that you can think that's amazing about this film it's the stunts that's the one thing that you think about once you've left it and you just go how in the hell did they pull this off so yeah in at number nine is netflix's the old guard so next up in the number eight position we have a film that kind of disappointed me in a lot of aspects and it's christopher nolan's tenet i'm a big fan of christopher nolan the dark knight trilogy are some of my favorite films of all time I love, 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 love Inception. Inception is probably in my top 10, top 20 of all time. Um, and some of the other films that I need to get around to watch, like Memento and Interstellar, they always get rave reviews. Dunkirk's another one that was absolutely amazing. The Great War movie. And he just kind of let me down. I, I He likes to do this high concept sci-fi um, mess with your mind type of films. Like Inception is like a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. And then Interstellar, they go to different planets and time folds in on itself. So these these big high concept ideas that Christopher Nolan has. And in Tenet, it's all about people that get inverted. So objects can be inverted, people can be inverted, which means they travel differently through time. They travel backwards through time. I tell you what, the stunt work in this was amazing. I think some of the performances, especially Robert Pattinson and Elizabeth Debicki, were really good. I can't knock them. Um, Robert Pattinson especially was kind of... Um, what's the word? He's kind of interesting, but he's a suave, debonair, kind of like James Bond. This is what this whole film kind of feels like. is like Nolan's version of James Bond except with the twist of inversion and going backwards and forwards in time. But unfortunately, um, what let it down massively, and I need to find out whether it's exactly the same on the Blu-ray, is you can't hear a lot of the words they were saying because it's overwhelmed with the music. I think Nolan, what he was trying to do was, was trying to get you into the mood rather than, don't, don't think about the exposition, don't think about why or what is happening. And think about why it's happening just go along for the ride which i think works from something that's such a high concept like tenet i think it could have done with a lot more it needed that extra bit of uh, exposition and explain um, and explanation in parts because it just felt very jumpy about it and not really that much was explained the cast are absolutely stellar in this john david washington is amazing the stunts are great the practical effects i can never shout at nolan because he makes practical effects look amazing um but overall i was kind of disappointed it didn't really need to be told this story didn't really need to be told if if i'm honest like like inception you get the story from the start and it's interesting throughout the whole whole film same with the dark knight he sets up all these concepts and all these themes in the beginning and they all pay off in the end whereas this one was kind of very um underbaked in the other like it needed a couple more like chops and changes or a little bit more editing or another little run through of the script because it just felt very underwhelming i was very disappointed still a very enjoyable film if not a bit confusing but I just wasn't as, um, 
didn't enjoy it as much as I thought I would. So yeah, so in at number eight is Tenet. So next up, in the number seven slot, we have Guy Ritchie's newest film, The Gentleman, and he is back with a bang. I love this film. I've probably seen, this is probably the film of this year that I've watched the most. I've probably watched it four or five times. It's so entertaining. The characters are engaging. This this like world that you kind of step into with all these gangsters playing off each other reminds me so much of Snatch and of Lockstock and I love those films. Some of Guy Ritchie's earliest. It also feels a little bit like his Sherlock Holmes films. Like a lot of the Guy Ritchie touches that you expect, like the sharp dialogue, um, quick cuts in between certain scenes and stuff, very stylized. It's here and it's also told by an unreliable narrator with Hugh Grant's character Fletcher and he's talking to Charlie Hunnam's character Ray. And they tell the story, obviously not out of order, but they tell it from where they currently are backwards and then cut back to the part that they're actually at and then carry on the story. I just thought it was really interesting. Matthew McConaughey fucking kills it in this role. He was so good in this film. Charlie Hunnam, I think he's just so good in gangster movies. He just really suits it. He's great in Sons of Anarchy. Um, he's great in Green Street. He's great in all these kind of like gangster films. I just think it really suits his personality and the way he looks. And uh, Michelle Dockery was amazing. I really enjoyed Henry Golding, who is going to be in the upcoming G.I. Joe spin-off, Snake Eyes. I thought his character, Dry Eye, was really interesting, very conniving. He has this kind of like tough exterior. He thinks he's a hard man, but underneath he's a bit of a snivelling coward. There's certain scenes where they kind of pick up on that. And the same with Jeremy Strong's character as well. I thought he was fantastic. He's he's had a pretty stellar year this year with The Gentleman and Trial of the Chicago 7. I think he's great in both movies. So it's just an absolute stellar ensemble cast with a great script, great pacing, great stylization from Guy Ritchie. And I absolutely loved it, to be totally honest. So that's The Gentleman in at number seven. So next up, in the number six spot, we have the second Pixar film. I kind of alluded to it in 10th spot with Onward. It's Soul. I actually wasn't kind of expecting this film. I knew Onward was coming along because it had Tom Holland and Chris Pratt and it was very like in your face marketing when I was seeing films like Call of the Wild, Birds of, the, Birds of Prey, it was always on the screen. Soul kind of came out of nowhere, to be totally honest. I wasn't expecting it. It was supposed to come out in cinemas, ended up getting dropped on Disney Plus. And when I sat and watched it, it was a film about loss for a start, about um, not wasting your life, about trying to fight off death, which are really strong topics for a Pixar kids film. Obviously, Pixar isn't just for kids. It always has adult elements to it. But this is probably the most adult Pixar film there's probably ever been because you obviously can't really explain the topics of death and resurrection and the great beyond and souls and things like that with children. They, they get the funny jokes and things like that, but it's, this feels very much like a Pixar movie for adults. It stars Jamie Foxx in the lead role, um, playing Joe, who's a musician who's never got his break. And when he finally gets his break, he ends up falling down a manhole and essentially dying. And he goes to the great beyond. He's, he's like, my life's too short. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Ends up running into 22, which is played by Tina Fey, which are kind of these baby souls. He goes from great beyond to the great before with all these baby souls where they learn what it's like to be on Earth so they can get ready to go to Earth. And 22 is this soul that's been around for years and years and years and years. And all the people in the world, all the famous people, They've tried to train her and mentor her. I've never got through to her. And then we have this unlikely partnership of this person who hates Earth and doesn't want to go to Earth and doesn't get the, the whole shtick behind it. And you have this guy that misses Earth and really wants to get back to Earth because he's just about to have his big break and he doesn't want to feel like he's failed in life. They find their way back to Earth. 
with Joe in the cat's body and 22 in Joe's body and she learns why life is so important, why earth is so good, what all these things that we think of and take for granted are really important. And I, it was just a really touching, um, interesting story that I can kind of get my teeth into. A bit more mature and obviously like people take animation for granted they think it's just a kid's thing but i think this and into the spider verse and many others have proved that you can do animation for adults and i just really enjoyed this film it got me thinking about my life not wasting my time and um, thinking about what i want to do in the future and it just it was it really touched me i got a little bit weepy i have to be honest and I just thought it was a really, really good film. Like most of these on this list, although they're not the big like Marvel, DC, Star Wars types of films, these smaller films that you don't expect to come along can end up sometimes being your favourites. So yeah, so that's Soul in at number six. So next up we have in the fifth position, Bad Boys for Life. So it's the third Bad Boys in the Bad Boys trilogy now. Not directed by Michael Bay this time, directed this time by the partnership of Adil and Bilal. And this one just kind of had this epic feel that I don't feel like some of the other bad boys films do have. They feel like very buddy cop drama, entertaining, but an action, but not really any substance, or it doesn't feel like it's this story on this epic scale. It's just a bunch of cops going around and hunting people down. Kind of get that towards the end of Bad Boys 2 when like the whole group comes together to save uh, Martin Lawrence, Marcus Burnett's sister. But for an older Will Smith and for an older Martin Lawrence, I thought this story was great. The new characters that came into it played by uh, Vanessa Hudgens, Paula Nunes, Alexander Ludwig and Charles Melton were actually really, really good additions. This film mainly focuses on Will Smith's character, Mike Lowry. Mike finds out he has a long lost son that he had way before he met Marcus. And this whole thing becomes more and more epic. This son is trying to hunt down all the people that put his mum behind bars and almost kills Mike Lowry, Will Smith's character. And he kills quite a lot of other people off that are like bad boys staples, like the chief commissioner, and things like that and it just felt it had this epic feel around it that i don't really get from a, a lot of michael bay films like it feels very light very fluffy whereas this one felt a lot more grounded a lot more epic like what this had real world stakes within the world it's not just if oh the movie is happy and ends well for everybody there's another happy ending it was very much a, a sad tinged ending and I just really enjoyed it. I, I love the bad boys formula. Anytime Martin Lawrence and Will Smith get together, they are comedy gold, if not action gold. Will Smith is starting to star in these films that he carries on his shoulders, but feel very epic and grounded, a bit like Gemini Man as well. And yeah, it was, it was very interesting cast. I, I liked all the people that were in it. They're all interesting. They're all funny. The stunt work in it was really good. Um, there's a scene in particular where Will Smith is chasing his cat. Uh, well, Mike Lowry is chasing his son for a building. They're climbing all over these buildings and stuff. And it was epic. And there's a bike chase in it as well that was really good. If that's how they're going to end it, it's a good cap on the whole trilogy. But obviously they're going to make a bad boys for it. It made tons of money, realistically, in comparison to its budget. It was one of the first movies to come out this year. So it kind of had that time before COVID to actually do well. So yeah, that's really um, my thoughts on Bad Boys for Life. Bad Boys is in at my number five spot. So yeah, let's move on to the next one. So... In at number four, we have probably the only DC movie because I didn't see Wonder Woman in time to watch this film and I kind of watched it in 2021. Birds of Prey. Margot Robbie is Harley Quinn. That's the thing I'm going to say off the top. People say Robert Downey Jr. is Tony Stark when you see him in real life. When you see Ryan Reynolds 
he is Deadpool in real life. Hugh Jackman is Logan, is Wolverine. I can now definitively say that Harley, uh, Margot, I'm calling her Harley Quinn. Margot Robbie is the definitive Harley Quinn. She's funny, she's interesting, she's badass. She gets to thrive without being Joker's little puppet. Because in a lot of her depictions, especially like in Batman the Animated Series and some of the comics and stuff, she's very much like the Joker's sidekick. And they have this like kind of toxic relationship where she, he, he basically bullies her to stay by it and she stays by his side. They kind of like, not really a good relationship to be in, but she loves him so much and she thinks he's attractive, so she just sticks with him. Like a lot of people's relationships that I know. But she kind of goes out on her own and f has to find her own way. And she's fantastic. All the, all the extra characters like the Birds of Prey, Black Canary played by Jenny Smollett Bell, Huntress played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, Renee Montoya played by Rosie Perez, all those four women together, it's dynamite. They, they bounce off each other so well. They have some really entertaining interactions. The action in this, like I said earlier, when we were talking about the old guard, the stunts in this film are fucking phenomenal. The John Wick guys have totally outdone themselves. Like there's a specific scene in a, a prison cell with Harley Quinn when she, when the rain's coming down and she's got a baseball bat and it, fucking sick and the last scene last uh, fight in the fun house as well the choreography like obviously they say a lot of fight scenes in movies are like dances because you've got to learn certain moves and where to go and it's just so good the punches feel so real like when they hit someone it actually feels like they're hitting them like you feel the weight behind the punches and the weight of the strikes and things it's phenomenal that this is probably the best stunt work I've seen in a film in a long, long, long time. Without even talking about the fun, hectic, interesting storyline that goes throughout the whole film. Ella J. Vasco is Cassandra Kane. She's really interesting. She's a great character. She do not take shit, even though she's that little bit younger. She's obviously the main kind of like MacGuffin type person because of the diamond that she ends up pickpocket in and swallowing essentially and um she's even really good she's she can hold her own with these like women that are two to three times as old as her and they all just feel like this really interesting people i want to spend more time with these characters i'd like to see a birds of prey like birds of prey by itself without margot robbie without harley quinn and just see those rosie perez um renee montoya um Huntress and Black Canary just have their own film together. I think that'd be great. But I cannot finish this part of the video. I cannot stop talking about Birds of Prey without talking about Ewan McGregor. He is fucking phenomenal. His acting in this film is great. You can tell he's having fun. He's chewing the scenery. He's, he's mannerisms are so good he could tell that he's this guy that plays the showman on the outside but deep down inside he's this psychopathic serial killer nut job and he's one of those like daddy's like he's got daddy's money and he's now trying to make a name for himself through doing crime and he's just aggressive and he has these little tendencies and i've never seen ewan mcgregor do this type of role obviously he's so good as obi-wan kenobi obi-wan kenobi is my favorite star wars character Ewan McGregor is one of my favourite actors and he fucking kills it. He's so good in this film. Him with Harley Quinn, uh, with Margot Robbie and the Huntress team, they are fantastic. It's such an interesting, it's such an entertaining film. There's laughs, there's thrills, there's spills, there's action, there's anything you want in a film. And it ranks in at my number four spot. And in at the third spot, we have... Sam Mendes' 1917. You may be kind of arguing that this film came out in 2019 if you're in the States, but I saw it in January of this year. It feels so long ago now, before Corona and everything. I actually forgot that this and the second spot came out so early in the year. I actually forgot that they came out this year. I thought they came out in 2019. But oh my god, what a fantastic war movie. We don't normally see a lot of World War I movies. It's always World War II, Vietnam or modern. 
and this is inspired by uh, Sam Mendes's family, his grandfather, his great grandfather, I believe. And it's this story about these two soldiers, and they're sent across no man's land through Germany, through all the fighting, through all the battles. These two have got to sneak through trenches and everything to go and call off this attack that's going to save the lives of 1600 men. And it's such a journey. You follow these guys, like the camera's pretty much all one shot. The whole film is shot in one shot, essentially. It makes, obviously it's not shot in one shot, but the, the camera trickery and the cuts make it look like the whole film is shot consistently throughout the whole thing. There's, they make a point of it on the documentary that like the cuts are so precise that you wouldn't have an idea. Like some of the cuts, like they'll do a pan in 360 shot around the two actors and that'll be a cut and you wouldn't know at all. It's so fluid, it's so immersive. The music in this by uh, Thomas Newman, I believe, is fantastic, like, absolutely amazing. It, it immerses itself and enmeshes itself within the plot that it's kind of like its own character. You kind of follow just these two guys and the music kind of feels like its own third character. And the shit they had to go through, crawling through no man's land, through dead bodies, dead horses and things like that, going through trenches where booby traps have been laid, fighting through uh, the German offensive, and then slowly but surely getting there. It feels like this epic journey, following from one step through like the trenches, the British held trenches, all the way through. And you can kind of track it all the way through like all these places there's hardly any cuts so it just feels like you just follow them throughout this whole journey and the two actors George McKay and uh Dean Charles Chapman kill it there is a shock through about halfway through the film that I didn't see coming at all I watched this in the cinema in the kinema around the corner from me and I didn't see it coming at all because throughout the whole marketing we expected just these two guys and to get to have one of them killed off like not even halfway through the film was a shock like the biggest shock probably i've had all year but it's so immersive you feel like you're in the trenches you feel dirty and gritty and horrible and throughout the uh experience we ran into some of like britain's greatest actors you have people like mark strong benedict cumberbatch andrew scott colin firth and we also get to see a surprise appearance by Richard Madden, Game of Thrones fame. Obviously, Dean Charles Chapman, we kind of know him as, we know him obviously as Tom and Baratheon from Game of Thrones. Same with Richard Madden. He's uh, Rob Stark, obviously. So just all these great British actors piled into a film by one, one of the greatest British directors, Sam Mendes. Absolute enthralling ride. You have to check it out. In at number three is 1917. Into the second spot, we have Jojo Rabbit. I love Taika Waititi. Any film he's in, he manages to mix the drama with the entertaining. His laughs are some of the, like, the funniest laughs in any film. Thor Ragnarok, I would argue, is probably the funniest Marvel film but ever, ever. Honestly, I die with some of the jokes in that film. And... Obviously, what we do in the shadows, he's great in. That was a great film. I, I need to catch the series. I just really love that stuff. And this is based in World War II. It follows this Hitler youth, Jojo Betzler, and his mum, played by Scarlett Johansson. And we have appearances from Sam Rockwell as his captain. Rebel Wilson turns up. Alfie Allen as well, who's another Game of Thrones graduate, essentially. It's such an interesting story about this guy who's hit a Hitler fanatic. He even has an imaginary friend, Adolf Hitler. It's played by Taika Waititi and the interaction. It's so cute and honest and innocent is the word. Through all this enmeshed, what we know is like the Third Reich, Hitler's in a circle, what was happening in Berlin. We just follow this one kid and his mum. And what we know is his mum is hidden a young Jewish girl in their attic. So 
So throughout this whole film, it's all about the relationship between this Jewish girl, played by Thomas and McKinsey, and Jojo Betzler, played by Roman Griffin Davis. And these two, they're so cute. Such an interesting duo. Obviously, she's slightly older than him, but you can tell he, he's like, oh, he has to hate her because she, he's a Jew, and then realises that not all Jews are bad people, obviously. But um, he, he fights against his, like, Nazi propaganda brain, essentially. And then you have Scarlett Johansson, who's so great in this film. How she, like, didn't win an Oscar for her performance in this film, I don't know. She is amazing in this film. She, she has the right blend of motherly love, and there's a scene where she plays his dad that is so entertaining. But there's also, with this innocent story about this young boy and this young girl and the young boy's mum, is the ever no intention that she's going to get found out, like both the mum and the Jewish girl are going to get found out. It's always in the back of your mind and you never think about it because you're so enthralled with this relationship between these two and how Jojo goes about his life meeting Captain K, played by Sam Rockwell, and Rebel Wilson's character, and Alfie Allen, and going out and doing all this youth stuff. You, you kind of don't think about the Hitler stuff, and the Nazi stuff, because you're so enthralled with this pairing. It's such a small, intimate film in places, that it, it pulls on your heartstrings. I get, this film gets me really emotional, especially with the shock, where, his mum gets found out as is part of the German resistance movement and this this tragic but beautiful scene of when he's following a butterfly out in town and comes across a pair of shoes. We automatically know who it is. We don't even need to see the face because throughout the whole film they've been showing us his mum's shoes when because she keeps teaching him how to do his shoe shoelaces up. So it's this poignant scene of shit, they were getting us ready for this mind-blowing reveal which you can kind of see coming but you don't know until it actually happens and it just happens out of nowhere it pans up from him looking at the butterfly and then he stood up and all that's next to him is just a pair of shoes and he turns around and he sobs and sobs and sobs and sobs and I sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed in the cinema such a great intimate film in this whole massive war um, that's going on with ounces of comedy, ounces of fun. How can you make Hitler and Nazis fun? Ask Taika Waititi. But I actually really enjoyed this film. It's my number two film of the year. So in at number one, ladies and gentlemen, we have my favorite film of the year, which is Trial of the Chicago 7. This movie is so 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 good obviously i liked it so much it's my number one it's directed by aaron sorkin who's one of the best script writers in hollywood he's written some of the best movies west wing the tv series he wrote he's done the rock the american president enemy of state the social network moneyball the steve jobs uh, biopic well, his first directorial outing in molly's game He's written some of the best scripts and of some of the best movies of the past years. I love Moneyball. Social Network was really good. Steve Jobs was really good. Uh, the West Wing, tons of people love that series. He is mind-blowing. And doing these courtroom dramas, I never thought it'd be interesting in the slightest. I saw the trailer and thought, with this cast, that... They're, I'd enjoy it because it's got people like Eddie Redmayne who's from all sorts of stuff but mainly from the Fantastic Beasts is what a lot of people know him from. Yay Abdul Mateen II who plays Black Manta and Aquaman, Sasha Baron Cohen, Daniel Flaherty, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Michael Keaton, Frank Langella, John Carroll Lynch, Noah Robbins, Mark Rylands, Alex Sharp, Jeremy Strong. Just keep going on and on and on. This whole ensemble cast is amazing. It follows the titular Chicago 7, who are a group of anti-Vietnam war protesters who are charged with conspiracy and crossing state lines with the intention of inciting the riots at the 1968 Democratic National Convention in Chicago. I thought it was best to read that out because it's a bit of a mouthful. But this whole cast, Sasha Baron Cohen, obviously everybody knows him as Borat and 
Ali G and all that, but he's such a good dramatic actor. He he plays the role of Abby Hoffman so well. He the, the in the, in the debates between all the characters, even though they're fighting for the same side, the intricacies and all the mini fallouts that they have and the courtroom drama, you you get fed up with the judge. You get angry at the judge played by Frank Langella. He, he, he's just this. You can see him as this old miserable git that nobody likes and shouldn't have been as bad as he was and shouldn't have really been on the case to be totally honest obviously the government were pushing for a conviction they went to get these guys indicted to indict their movement and it's just a very intriguing story with a bunch of characters that are actually interesting you follow it's basically just a courtroom drama the whole time with flashes in between when when they have recesses and when they have breaks for days just to get to know these characters I actually felt like I knew these characters after I left the film. Eddie Redmayne is fantastic. Obviously British actors are better at doing American accents and playing Americans than Americans are. So it, it was fantastic. This, the drama between each and, e each and every scene and some of these characters fighting against their own rules that they put on themselves like John Carroll Lynch's character, David Dellinger. He's a uh, basically a pac pacifist, and he doesn't punch anyone. And then when he actually punches someone because he gets so frustrated, you can see how much it breaks him to have actually done that. And you can see, although these people are all fighting for the same side, how they all differ in their commitment to the same side. And there's there's a scene with uh, Yaya Abdul Mateen's character Bobby Seal, who's the national chairman of the Black Panther Society at the time and there's a scene in particular where they have to gag him and everything to shut him up when he shouldn't have even been in the courtroom in the first place they tried to just shove him in with each other so they had a black guy in there to intimidate others and it's just such an interesting film from start to finish netflix have outdone themselves netflix seem to keep getting oscar worthy films we've had the irishman marriage story and no doubt we're going to get more and more next year well 2021 and 2022 and I just fucking love this film. It's my favourite film of the year. It may be one of my favourite films I've seen in a long, long time. Aaron Sorkin killed it. You have to watch this film. You'll love it. It's got such an entertaining end. It's got such an uh, uplifting story for such a... It was just absolutely amazing. So that's my list, ladies and gentlemen. That's everything I want to say on all my films for this year. I hope you all enjoyed. I know this one's probably going to be a little bit on the longer side. These list videos kind of always do and I always tend to ramble on. But yeah, as always, don't forget to like, subscribe and hit the notification bell to get notified every single time I upload. Don't forget to go and follow me on my, all my socials. And drop down in the comments below what you what was your top 10 of 2020. Yours may look totally different. I left out films like Sonic, Wonder Woman, Queen and Slim, Lighthouse, Bombshell. The Way Back, King of Staten Island, Unhinged, Greenland. So maybe some of mine wouldn't have made your list and some of yours might not make my list. So this is the thing that I love with film debate and film discussions that we can have a difference of opinions and we can have a discourse about it. It's the best thing and I've missed it since being away from my channel. So yeah, ladies and gents, as always, thanks for checking out the video. I hope you've had a smashing time just like myself. And I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.